I want to thank um, X for Youth, uh, and really, uh, I my wall is still blank because I never have time to put anything up. So now I have an award to put up um, to inspire me to put the rest of the things up. And I want to thank. Um, could we just have um, all of the X for Youth young people um, just stand up because you are our roses. <laughs> Another hint, that long of an applause means you really have done a good job. <laughs> um, but I want to thank you all for the privilege of being here this evening with you. I don't take that lightly. Can everybody hear me okay? Okay, making sure I always get to practice my cafeteria voice, which I don't get to use as much anymore in this role. Um, I want to thank uh, Principal Anthony Felder, who is here, um, from Walter P. Carter, and I need um, I, I need to just take a brief 20 seconds to say um, <clears throat> that, that Principal Felder um, took over at w Walter P. Carter um, when we had a, an unexpected vacancy there. The former principal um, had another opportunity. We were like, oh my God, what are we going to do the middle of the year? And at the time, Principal Felder was actually supporting other principals. And so the fact that he stood up and said, I will do this, and when he came back and we had our interview, because I speak with every principal that gets appointed under my, um, my administration, my leadership, um, and I'm not going to tell his story because I'm a firm believer that people need to be able to tell their own story as the validation of who they are and who God has created them to be. But I will steal a little snippet in saying, that <clears throat> Principal Felder, when I was asking, like, okay, you're back, why do you want to be back, why do you want to be doing this, why are you going to help out in this way, he got incredibly passionate and full, and he said, because I am the young people of Baltimore. I am them, I am the living example, I'm paraphrasing a little bit, um, but I, I am the example, right, of what it means to invest in the young people of Baltimore, and I want to do that for them, to show what is possible. And so I want to thank you um, for taking that on. <laughs> and then I, um, I want to thank Acts for Youth. And I want to thank all of you who are board members, all of you who are supporters of Acts for Youth. Um, do not take your support lightly. Um, I um, have said on many an occasion the fact that I have friends um, like George Hopkins who I can call um, or who others can call on my behalf to say can you help me out um, like he did this evening um, by saying um, the prayer over uh, the opening um, this evening all the way to friends who I can call um, who I can say hey I need a check for five thousand dollars for this student who has lost their aid package, I need you to write it and I need it to be written in 48 hours. And they're like, really, you're calling me for this? And I say, yes, I am calling you for this. And they do it and they do it because they know that young people are worth it and that I am an astute, being married to someone in finance, I am an astute surveyor of where the good investment is. And I will tell you today, as you sit here, that our young people are the best investment that this city has to offer. So I thank you. I thank you in whatever way, large or small, um, whether it's coming out, whether it's making calls, whether it's writing checks, or whether it is just being the person, the one person at the cocktail party when everyone else is saying, what good can come from Baltimore? If you are the one person in that room, at that dinner party, in that meeting, who says, yay, but I know what the power of God has the power to do. And we don't always say, you know, power of God. And I remember I went through um, at least a year and a half at Harvard um, before people knew. Um, they had guessed that I was a believer, but when they found out, was during a time when they were like railing on, and I come from a, um, I grew up in a Pentecostal church, 
Um, my, uh, my father grew up in an AME church, and so they felt very comfortable kind of ragging on people of faith, right, which is normally, can sometimes happen. And when I said, actually stop, you don't know what you're talking about fully, and they were like, oh my God, you? <laughs> right? And they said, but you're actually kind. You're actually not judgmental. You clearly have opinions, and any of you who have seen me in any interview ever know that I have opinions, right? But it was that something different that made the difference. And it is that something different in how we love, in how we believe, in how we work out our faith that I would argue is the greatest testimony, particularly at a time when words right now are cheap. You can get on, you can put anything, anything on social media. You can be a star tomorrow if you get how many, tell me baby, um, how, how many tweets do you have to get before you're really big time? Do you know, is it like 10,000 or something, right? So if you, get, if you get a couple thousand tweets, you're in it tomorrow. And what that has caused, what that has caused for our young people is a need to have a narrative of hope that matches action. And, and, and they are, and I remember talking to um, Reverend Ray Hammond, who leads Bethel AME Church in Boston, and just quick synopsis, uh, Reverend Hammond was one of the key on the ground leaders um, in an effort very much like Acts for Youth when um, Boston went through, Boston Mass, where I'm from, uh, went through the Boston Miracle. And I don't know how many of you know what the Boston Miracle was, but it was that time when, when Boston had the highest murder rate ever in its history. And Pastor Ray led a group of people of faith, right, in an on-the-ground effort. And the Boston Miracle ended up being, um, frankly, a Harvard case study uh, five or six years later of a period of time within 16 months that the murder rate plummeted from the highest it had ever been to the lowest it had ever been. And when I talked to Reverend Hammond, and I got him on the phone, because my husband's like, you got to call Reverend Ray. And I asked him, I said, so what was it? He said, yes, we had prayer support, and that was absolutely necessary. But what they did was they got people of faith, people of God, to wrap their arms in real ways around the young people in the city of Boston. And we identified, they identified using hardcore data who those young people were, who were most likely to fall through the cracks. And it was people of faith who rose to the occasion. And as we just heard, it wasn't for proselytizing. It was for saying, you are worthy of our time and attention. And we commit to you. And as young people started asking questions, like, well, why are you still here? Why are you still here, Acts for Youth? Why are you still with me two, three years later? Then they could respond, because the love of Christ compels me, right? Because you are worthy enough, because you are his creation. And we have a generation of young people in this city, and I would argue in this country, because I have friends who work at elite prep schools who will tell you they, those young people are also in a crisis of faith. Those young people are experiencing depression and anxiety at levels that are unprecedented. The difference is young people in Baltimore City don't have the safety nets. And so the holes that they fall through are larger and can have larger impact. So one of the things that Reverend Ray taught me was that don't over or underestimate the power of relationship. Don't underestimate that each young person that has someone that they can basically put through the test of time actually makes a difference, right? So, because what happens when, when, when at least when I have conversations with young people and when I talk to Reverend Ray about this, like, they are really savvy. Not only are they faster on that, what was that, that hoot zoot thing? What did we just do? Was it cahoots? My God, we gave it to the youngest person at the table and our time increased exponentially, right? But they are also, also amazingly keen at telling the real from the fake. 
And they know better than, frankly, most of the adults that I work with when someone's coming with a rap and when someone is coming with real stuff. And so the reason why Acts for Youth in year 10 right, can have such an impact is because it represents not only a change in narrative, right, but a change in how young people experience adults and how they experience relationships. So the other piece I wanted to talk about a little bit tonight is this whole piece about narrative, right? And so any of you um, who, um, and I met a couple of people on the way in who were like, God, I just want you to know we pray for you every time we see you. And, then like, and I was like, great, keep it coming, right? Keep it coming, because I need it. And um, <clears throat> I actually believe that it's prayer that's actually kept me this stable. Um, I was telling George Hopkins on the way in um, that his wife, who is an amazing anointed woman, has just this divine timing of texting me the right uh, worship song link, the right scripture, on the right day, at the right time. It's like she just knows, and I know how she knows, but she does. And, but, but I will say this to you. Part of why I can do what I do is because I believe that we each have a piece of this race to run. That if you are looking at me, my administration, anything that goes on as kind of single-handedly wiping out generational impact, right, of frankly, some really shoddy policy practices, right, systematic racism that is embedded in a lot of the presumptions and interactions, right, of how we go about this work, that's not going to happen. But what can happen is we can recapture significant amounts of ground so that we recapture a generation of young people. And this is about, for me, generation building. And so prior to assuming the leadership of Baltimore City Schools, um, <clears throat> the Lord had me go back and read, um, uh, it was Daniel. And I walked through, I, I read through, and I was like, okay, okay. And then it was, it was like, it's just about a generation. I can only do what my strip of runway is. And then I've got to prepare all the young people we heard from tonight, which is why you all coming up and speaking and introducing and standing strong even though you're shaking, we need you to be able to do that because I only have so much runway. And I've got to have young people, you have to have, we have to have young people to pass that on. But one of the biggest challenges we have is the challenge of the narrative. And it's the challenge of the narrative because I would argue as people of faith, what we speak has greater power than just regular ordinary words. What we speak has scriptural precedent. What we speak has a different level of power than whatever we see on social media, whatever a broadcast or an op-ed writer wants to write. What we speak has the power of promise and the promise of a love that supersedes all loves. And so when we think about the narratives and what was so interesting about the roses and the concrete and the Tupac Shakur, God, I know I am old when Tupac is like the poet of the day. I'm like, oh my God, right? Like this is, I am so old. No more Phyllis Wheatley, right? We're going straight to Tupac. So, um, but in doing this, what's really interesting is while I don't have a scripture for concrete and roses, I do have a scripture that I think actually predates the roses and concrete. And that is the narrative in Ezekiel about dry bones. And it is the narrative around, do we believe that dry bones can live? Do we believe that what others look at and say are cast away, are damaged, are incomplete, actually can have life spoken in everyday acts and live again. And literally have sinew and flesh brought back onto, any doctors in the room, by the way? Any doctors? Oh my god, how do we not have a doctor? Really? Okay. One or two. Well, yes, you are. 
I need somebody who can resuscitate me if I pass out. <laughs> okay, that's what I wanted. I just want to know, do I have somebody who can resuscitate me if I, right? So, so like the, okay, thank you. See, I knew, some, there's always medical people in the room, right? So, so this piece about like dry bones requires a different type of vision, and I would argue a type of vision that people of faith are singularly prepared to do. Because we have to see what to the physical world is not possible. And so when people ask me, how do you get up and do this every day? It's because I speak to dry bones every day. And in the process of speaking to dry bones, what begins to happen, and it's happening tonight as you talk to young people, you're realizing that actually we got a lot of young people already who are incredibly smart, incredibly talented, right? And actually, right, are the evidence that dry bones can live. And so the narrative that we speak has to change. And it doesn't mean that you don't negate what the facts are. And it's interesting because um, my, 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 the person who was, um, was speaking at our church on Sunday said, faith does not mean you deny the facts. What faith is, is truth being spoken to facts in a way that you can change what the facts are. So the truth that we speak, and that I would argue, right, is the thrust of the power of an organization like Acts for Youth, is that that speaking actually does produce life. When you tell young people you are absolutely, positively, articulate, and beautiful, and you have the skills to go to Western and do incredibly well, and to come back and take my job, because I am tired, baby girl. <laughs> right? That's right. Right? That has a power that supersedes just the facts and figures. It's a power, right, that brings a life to a community, to a city, that many want to cast aside. And let me tell you, it is intimately linked to identity, right? So, so one piece is changing the narrative. But you know, you got to have some substance to change the narrative. But the other piece I will tell you is this is all about connecting young people to their identity. The more we do this work, whether it's, whether it's English, whether it's mathematics, right? The young people who crumble when they hit that first quadratic equation, are usually young people who don't have enough of a sense of self or a belief in themselves no matter what room they're in. Because I watched kids crumble at Harvard, right? When they don't know who they are and what they've called to be. And so part of the work that you all are supporting is that confidence building, that sense of self, that absolutely is grounded in knowing who you are in Christ. So we had had a really rough patch. How many people remember this January when we had a whole lot of heating issues? Go ahead and raise your hand. You're not being unkind, right? So it got rough for a bit, right? And like at that time, and this is no disrespect for those of you who have Sinclair stock, I love you in Jesus' name, right? But like, right? So we were getting like all the Project Baltimore, like let's pick every possible thing that could ever be wrong in the school system and let's make a week long story about it, right? It's all going on at the same time, right? And I said, and Principal Felder, can attest to this, right? I got in a room of principals, people are like, oh my God, how in the world are we gonna, everybody's spinning. And I said, you have to remain focused. You have to stay focused on what the core work is. And don't worry about what people say about you, which is how I can do this work, because I, I do not, and one of the things I said, and you correct me if I'm wrong, is I know to whom I belong. Now, some people in the room got it and said amen. <laughs> and other people were like, well, that's really deep and like esoteric and like, you know, metamorphosis. I don't really know who the who is, but okay. <laughs> but there is something about being rooted and affirmed as one who was worthy of the creator's time and effort. One in whom the creator of the heavens and earth deposited gifts and talents 
And the knowledge of that, born out and blossomed under the tutelage and the nurture of human relationship, is a powerful, powerful antidote to whatever life throws at you. So like when it got really hard, I'd come home, George Hawkins was my husband, and he'd be like, baby girl, it's fine. It's going to be OK. And I'd call my mother, and she'd be like, oh, you know I have the prayer team praying. <laughs> and I'd talk to my dad, and he's like, well, you know, baby girl, you can always come home. <laughs> right? And so for me, I have been incredibly blessed, like my whole life. I remember when I first started dating, and my dad gave me a credit card. I'm like, why are you giving me a credit card now? Like, you didn't give it to me when I really wanted it, right? And he said, because I don't want you ever in a situation where some young man convinces you that you have to give up something because you don't have another way out. And I want you to know wherever you are, you can always come home. And so when people want to know right, where that standing comes from, it is that combination. It's the combination of knowing to whom I, be who I belong, but it's also the combination of having others around me who reaffirm my worth and reaffirm the work and the vision God has called me to do. And the beautiful part about how he has set this thing up is that the secret is if you don't think you have a family, he has said that he is your family and that he will give you a family and that he is your father regardless of whatever else is going on in your life. It's just that our young people need folks who remind them of that. They need to know what character looks like. They don't need our monologues. And please remind me of that, because I now have, like, I'm on the brink of having teenagers, so please text me from time to time over the next four or five years and remind me they don't need a lecture, Sonia. Right? But that's what they need. And so, Part of the power of this work of Acts for Youth is you all get to do what oftentimes in the day-to-day -day of schools becomes really difficult to do, right? We want to make personal relationships with every single young person. And if you're a principal like Principal Felder, you try to do that, and your school secretary does that, and other people do that. But for a lot of our kids, they need more. They need more of that holding. They need more people reaffirming you have greatness, and let me show you what it looks like to put that in motion. And so that's the power of this work. That's what we need. It's part of why, even at, as an academician at my core, when I re-entered Baltimore and talked to young people and talked to families, one of the things that came out over and over again is we are more than test scores. We are more than just what the park test says. We actually are good at other things. And so part of why we're pushing this and supporting schools in this development of the whole child, all that is is a fancy way of saying we want to develop young people in all of their talents, all of their interests, and all of their gifts. And you help us do that in whatever way you participate in this organization and any way that you right, participate in the lives of young people. So my question for you is, as people of faith, will you have the courage? Will you tap into your relationship with Christ to speak life to dry bones? And it is not for everyone. I will tell you that. But I would argue that at this time, in this place, at this hour, our country, our city, and our young people need people of faith who will speak not only with words, yes, with words, but with action following. Because, frankly, the longevity of our society and our community depends on it. If we do not invest this word and this power in this generation, there is no escaping it. And I want to be able to say with clear conscience, I have run 
the race that has been set before me. I am in a relay. I am no miracle worker. I just work for the miracle worker. That's all I am. And so I thank you for your support. I thank Acts for Youth for the work that you all do. And I thank our young people. Thank you for persevering. Thank you for reminding us that beauty and talent and smarts lie in so many different packages. Thank you for representing your families well. And you represent your families well, and I don't need to know what state your family is in. I just know that you are an extension of them, and you being here today shows the essence of who they are. So thank you. Thank you, thank you all. And I turn it back over to the Extra Youth Team.